there, my valued and highly treasured viewers and listeners, and welcome back to your channel of choice. My name is Dr. Nath Arwa. I am a clinical pharmacist by training and by profession, and I am the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, a premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare sector workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference we have patient safety, medication therapy management, and optimal treatment outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to our team. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So I would like to humbly urge you to sit back and spare me part of your precious time as I share tips that you may find useful in your line of duty with you. So welcome. So question number one reads, a 69 year old male patient suffering from type 2 diabetes bellitus presents to the endocrinology clinic at your hospital. He currently takes a thousand milligrams of metformin twice daily orally after breakfast and dinner. His A1c is 8.5%. He has a past medical history of coronary artery disease, status post multiple stent placements. He is hypertensive and suffers from hyperlipidemia. Uh, according to your lab, the EGFR is 15 ml per minute. And this patient clearly tells you he has a preference for oral antihypoglycemics and declines to use any insulins or any other subcutaneously administered antihyperglycemics at the moment. He has nibble phobia. So my question to you is, what would be the most ideal therapeutic plan for this patient? Would you opt to initiate exenatide? Would you initiate epagliflozin? Would you initiate saxagliptin or would you settle for increasing the metformin dose from 1000 mg twice daily to 1000 mg thrice a day? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So I'll settle for B and initiate empaglifosine. Now, we know that SGLT2 inhibitors like empaglifosine are the preferred class of medications in patients with established cardiovascular diseases. Now, empaglifosine and canaglifosine reduce cardiovascular morbidity in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus and with established cardiovascular disease. Exenatide, which is alternative A, is a GLP-1 receptor agonist with demonstrated cardiovascular disease benefit. It is administered sub-Q and isn't the best option for our particular patient who desires to be on oral antihyperglycemics. That makes this an inappropriate choice. Now, increasing the metformin dose to TDS thrice daily would exceed the approved maximum dosage, which is, uh, if I remember well, 2,550 milligrams daily. And for many forms of literature, we know that the maximum effective dose of metformin is 2,000 milligrams. So that would be exceeding the dose and exposing or subjecting the patient to unnecessary side effects including GI uh, adverse effects. Now saxagliptin alternative C doesn't provide atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease benefits at all. It has been shown to increase the risks of congestive heart failure exacerbations so not settle for that. 
it is important to consider comorbidities and choose agents that would provide the most benefit when you are treating such patients now the ada standards of diabetes care state that type 2 diabetes mellitus patients with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or diseases should be on an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonist with demonstrated cardiovascular disease benefits if appropriate and if feasible. Now, utilizing these interventions should give consideration to other side effects and complications that can occur within this class of drugs so that's just uh, by the way and i would like to re-emphasize that agents that have demonstrated beneficial atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk reduction in treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus include metformin empaglifosin liraglutide semaglutide and exenotide extended release form but uh, we know that uh, our patients does not desire to inject any form of antihyperglycemic so that limits our options to the oral forms among patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease at a high risk of heart failure or in whom heart failure coexists the sglt2 inhibitors are the preferred choice just by the way so let's move to the next slide please MMA 32 year old female patient presents to your accident and emergency department with a chief complaint of palpitations anxiety and diarrhea and she has no past medical history on reporting her current pregnancy has been complicated by hyperemesis gravidarum. She's expectant. Her home medications include prenatal vitamins for supplementation, a fixed dose combination of pyridoxine and doxylamine together with ondansetone to help sort out her vomiting and her nausea. And uh, she also takes a calcium supplement called formulated with vitamin D on physical examination of the head ear eye nose throat exophthalmos is noted and uh, the neck on examining the neck the thyroid gland appears enlarged now the lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally and uh, she has an irregular heart rhythm and heart rate and she's tachycardic her abdomen is non-tender non-distended and uh, during a neuro exam she appears mildly agitated some of the pertinent labs include a sodium level of 137 potassium of 4.1 chloride of 101 bicarb of 24 BUN of 20 glucose of uh, 215 serum creatinine of 0 0.8 WBC of 14.5 procalcitonin of 0 0.1 nanograms per ml and her TSH is 0 0.02 milliard units per liter and the free T4 is 10 nanograms per deciliter the cortisol is 10 micrograms per deciliter some of our vitals include a systolic blood pressure of 161 pretty high and a diastolic of 95 which is high as well her heart rate is 131 the heart is revving pretty fast she's tachycardic the temperature is 103.2 degrees fahrenheit so my question to you is which of the explanations below would most likely apply to this dear lady's clinical condition is this picture due to serotonin syndrome a thyroid storm myxedema coma or neuroleptic malignant syndrome i'll give you 10 seconds 
to choose the correct answer. So in my opinion, this is a case of thyroid storm, laboratory findings of low TSH and a high free T4 are indicative of hyperthyroidism. Thyroidism, sorry. Additionally, the patient presented with the GI disturbances, if I remember, she was diarrhea, uh, hyperpyrexia, and uh, palpitations. Now, those are signs and symptoms that are consistent with a diagnosis of thyroid storm. The patient also has uh, physical findings on the physical exam that are, to, in my opinion, suspicious for Graves' disease. She is currently pregnant, which is a known trigger for thyroid storm as well. Uh, answer C, myxedema coma is a severe form of hypothyroidism which would cause a high TSH level and a low 3T4 level. So that answer does not hold any water. And uh, this isn't a case of serotonin syndrome, in my opinion, due to lack of a significant serotoninergic burden. Uh, although we have ondansetron there, and it has been associated with the serotonin syndrome. This usually happens in the setting of multiple serotoninergic uh, medications co-administered together or in cases of ondansetron overdose. Now we have not been uh, told she has been overdosing her ondansetron so I would not suspect a case of serotonin syndrome. And uh, there are no dopaminergic medications being taken by this dear lady. So neuroleptic malignant syndrome, in my opinion, appears the wrong answer here. Thyroid storm is a rare medical emergency defined as severe hyperthyroidism, whereby the, the TSH is low and uh, T34 is elevated and uh, even T free T4 may be elevated with system um, systemic manifestations like pyrexia, cardiac, GIT, and even CNS disturbances. Now, the American Thyroid Association guidelines recommend the use of either what we call the batch vartovsky point scale which is abbreviated as BWPS or you can also use the Japanese thyroid association thyroid storm categories for identifying patients with thyroid storm like our patient here. Now the BWPS is a scoring system consisting of uh, seven criteria if I remember well which include pyrexia, tachycardia, CNS effects, GI or the hepatic dysfunction HCF AFib and even precipitating events and uh, scores that are equal to above 45 are usually highly suggestive of a thyroid storm now the Japanese Thyroid Association uses clinical presentation to identify definite versus suspected thyroid storm cases. Now, after initiation of an antithyroid hormone therapy, both T3 and T4 levels may remain high after the normalization of free T4 levels. Now, use of TSH to monitor and to titrate therapy isn't recommended since uh, TSH may remain suppressed for several months. Uh, 
if a pregnant patient requires antithyroid hormone therapy, it is recommended to give propyl thiouracil during the first trimester only because of the risks of liver toxicity. Now, methimazole, which is the other drug used to manage this condition, isn't recommended during the first trimester due to concerns of fetal abnormalities, but it is preferred during trimesters, trimesters 2 and 3. Those are just by the way, in case you, are encount you encounter uh, this condition in your line of duty. Let's move to the next slide. And the question reads, which of the medications listed below can reduce serum levothyroxine concentrations through a mechanism of increased clearance? Is it famotidine, atovastatin, phenytoin or calcium carbonate? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So phenytoin it is. Now phenytoin is the only drug on the above list which accelerates the removal of levothyroxine. In part, this happens through displacement of T4 from the binding sites to allow for greater clearance. Now atovastatin and famotidine don't induce enzymes involved in drug metabolism and they don't facilitate an increased clearance from the body at all. Now the last option, calcium carbonate, can bind to and prevent the absorption of levothyroxine but doesn't cause an increased rate of clearance from the body. Now just like to add and re-emphasize that phenytoin, carbapenem, sorry, carbamazepine and Phenobarbital are all known to cause a reduction in levothyroxine levels due to an increase in enzymes involved in drug metabolism. Remember their cytochrome P450 enzyme inducers. That's just a by the way. Let's move to the next question, please reads which of the antihyperglycemic medications listed below is associated with weight loss, urinary tract infections, and cases of euglycemic DKA? Is it citagliptin, liraglutide, canaglifosin, or treciba, which is the insulin degludec? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So canaglifosine it is. This side effect profile clearly corresponds to the SGLT2 inhibitor such as canaglifosine which is also marketed as Invocana. Now alternative uh, B, liraglutide which is marketed as Saxenda or Victoza is a GLP-1 receptor agonist that is associated with weight loss, worsening of symptoms of gastroparesis if they are already present, and it can also cause pancreatitis, but it does not cause UTIs, neither does it cause euglycemic DKA. So B is not the correct answer. Now, insulin, the gludec or treciba, is a long-acting basal insulin that is associated with cases of hypoglycemia and it also has a potential risk of pancreatitis. So that makes alternative C the correct answer. Let's move to the next slide please. DAM 58-year-old Hispanic man is admitted to your hospital for thyroid storm. Uh, this gentleman was accompanied by his wife because, in her opinion, 
he was acting strangely over the past few days and in our opinion he was more irritable and confused and has been nauseated twice in the past 12 hours some of the vitals uh, recorded at the A and D include uh, systolic blood pressure of 155, diastolic 93, heart rate of 24, temperature of 102.4 degrees Fahrenheit, and the EKG reveals a sinus tachycardia. So my question to you is which of the combinations listed below will be the most appropriate as initial treatment for Mr. D.A.M.? Would it be a combination of levothyroxine and propranolol or methimazole and propranolol or sodium iodide and amlodipine or methimazole and propyl thiouracil? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. I would administer methimazole and propranolol. Now, initially in thyroid storm, there are several therapeutic interventions which may be made. Now, initial pharmacologic treatments should focus on reducing thyroid hormone production and controlling the adverse effects of excessive thyroid hormone already in existence. The use of antithyroid medication such as methimazole or propylthiouracil would inhibit new synthesis of thyroid hormone. Now, use of methimazole and propylthiouracil together, which is alternative D, would be duplication of therapy and therefore inappropriate. You have to choose one of the two. Now, sodium iodide in alternative C can be used, but after one of the antithyroid medications has been administered. And uh, levothyroxine is a synthetic T4 and wouldn't be appropriate. Then, uh, to control the adverse effects of excessive thyroid hormone, an anti-adrenergic agent is usually prescribed alongside another drug. Now, the oral bitter blocker commonly used in such cases is propranolol, which is an unselective bitter blocker. And uh, in addition to blocking thyroid hormone adverse effects, such as elevated heart rate, fever, confusion, nausea, and vomiting. Mm, this drug, propranolol, may have a theoretical benefit of blocking the conversion of T4 to T3 if dosed high enough. That is usually generally above the 160 milligrams per day mark. Now, if patients are unable to tolerate non-selective beta blockers, such as uh, a case of an asthmatic patient who is also in thyroid storm, the use of a selective beta-1 blocker or a non-dihydropyridine ch calcium channel blocker such as diltiazem or verapamil or even the older agents such as resapin uh, may be successfully used. Now, in my opinion, amlodipine isn't appropriate since it is a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker and it can increase the heart rate while it selectively lowers the blood pressure in the periphery and it exerts no negative ionotropic effects. So, amlodipine would complicate issues here all those many words would make me settle for a combination of methimazole and propranolol to manage this patient's case. Let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, patient APT, a 30-year-old female, reports to your endocrinology clinic, 
with a past medical history of hypothyroidism which ensued after undergoing a thyroidectomy for the management of Graves disease that she was suffering from initially. She currently takes 75 micrograms of levothyroxine once daily before her breakfast on an empty stomach and she's been taking it at that dose for the past one year. Today, the clinical team at your endocrinology clinic uh, has opted to increase her dose to 88 micrograms once daily. So my question to you is, when ideally should she have her TSH lab rechecked to establish whether this dose adjustment is optimal for this patient should it be after 12 weeks six weeks one week or 14 days i'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer i would uh, recheck the values after six weeks now the reason behind it is the half-life of levothyroxine is uh, anywhere between six and eight days it is therefore recommended that the tsh be rechecked six to seven weeks after starting the medication or after change in dose because we know that it's uh, within that time that uh, the dose will have established she'll have reached a steady state according to your pkpd knowledge now checking the tsh sooner wouldn't be reflective of steady state for tsh thereby leading to a misinterpretation and a misinterpretation uh, could cause a clinician to inappropriately increase the levothyroxine dose so that's just a by the way to explain why six weeks is the ideal answer let's move to the next slide please mrs jqw a 60 year old female is due for an appointment at the endocrinology clinic due to a newly diagnosed graves disease prior to this appointment you desire to review signs and symptoms associated with graves disease so my question to you is which of the signs and symptoms listed below are consistent with graves disease would it be lethargy heat intolerance weight gain and a dry skin or is it tachycardia heat intolerance weight loss and exophthalmos or is it moist skin tachycardia weight gain and lethargy or is it tachycardia cold intolerance nervousness and exophthalmos i'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer so I would settle for answer B now Graves disease is the most common cause of thyrotoxicosis in non iodine deficiency regions in the world and it is an autoimmune disease caused by TSH receptor antibodies which stimulate the TSH receptors and that leads to overproduction of thyroid hormone. Now some of the symptoms of thyrotoxicosis may include for example weight loss, heat intolerance, the skin may be warm or moist, the patient may be anxious or nervous, um, tremors and palpitations may occur and some of the clinical signs may include for example AFib, tachycardia, goiter, exophthalmos and uh, some of the lab findings in Graves disease 
may include a decrease in TSH levels and the reason behind it is that the pituitary gland isn't having to produce TSH since the TSH receptor antibodies are themselves stimulating the thyroid instead. And you can also have an increased total or free T3 and T4 levels. And uh, they produce a negative feedback to the hypothalamus and the pituitary, which results in a decreased production of, production of uh, endogenous TSH. That's just a by the way to explain in many words why answer B is the most optimal choice. Let's move to the next slide, please. The question reads, which of the probable side effects listed below can occur in an unpredictable fashion or manner in patients receiving methimazole or propylthiouracil for the management of symptomatic hypothyroidism? Is it tachycardia, granulocytosis, lower extremity edema, or constipation? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So the correct answer is B. Now, agranulocytosis is low in incidence. Uh, most forms of literature quote 0.2 to 0.5 percent to be specific, and it is unpredictable and uh, it's the reason most clinicians avoid the use of methimazole or propylthiouracil for long-term therapy or management of these patients. They usually opt to treat for short durations. Let's move to the next slide, please. The next question is, which of the following is a limitation of utilizing A1C to assess glucose control that can be overcome by continuous glucose monitoring technology, what we abbreviate as CGM. Is it A1C only measures acute glucose excretions or excursions? Is it true that A1C fails to identify intra and interday glucose variations? Or is it A1C measures average glucose over the past six months? Or is it A1C gives information on a single point in time? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So B it is, A1C, unlike continuous glucose monitoring, which we abbreviate as CGM, fails to identify glucose variations. Now in my opinion, while A1C provides an average glucose, it doesn't provide any details about how narrow the range is that defines the average and how much time daily and on average the patient spends in a given range of blood glucose levels. Now A1C measures an average of glucose control but it doesn't give any direct information on accurate glycemic excursions or when they occur. I would also like to add that A1C measures an average glucose over the past two to three months. Now A1C can be problematic when there is a large variability in glucose control as it isn't an adequate assessment of disease management and risk. It is also inaccurate especially during pregnancy or when there are hemoglobinopathies or in the anemic population and even in cases of iron deficiencies. Now continuous glucose monitoring provides information on intra 
and interday glucose excursions and variability typically over a 14 day period while a sensor is worn now CGM can complement clinical decision making when coupled with A1C now I'd just like to add that an A1C of 7% is approximately equal to an average blood glucose of 150 milligrams per deciliter now you can add 35 milligrams per deciliter for every or for each 1% increase in A1C to quickly estimate the average blood sugars. That's just a by the way when you are managing type 2 diabetic patients. Let's move to the next slide please. JJM a male patient who presents to your hospital with euvolemic hyponatremic secondary to syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion what we abbreviate as CIADH the question to you is which of the drugs listed below is likely to result in SIDH syndrome of inappropriate diuretic hormone secretion is it narcotics, aminoglycosides, SSRIs, or the ARBs? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. In my opinion, there are two correct answers. Narcotics and SSRIs can cause it. Now, SID H is mainly caused by SSRIs, carbamazepine, barbiturates, and narcotics. Now, euvolemic hyponatremia can be seen in patients with hypothyroidism, with SIADH, with what we call beer potomania, or after ecstasy ingestion or even in cases of psychogenic polydipsia and even in water intoxication now some of the medications that can cause euvolemic hyponatremia include amphotericin B aminoglycosides lithium carbonate and phenytoin so that makes answer B wrong in this particular question now S inhibitors very rarely cause SIDH. Just for your information, let's move to the next slide, please. POB, a male patient, is admitted to your medical ward with euvolemic hyponatremia that fails to respond to fluid restriction or water restriction. So, my question to you is which? Of the medications listed below would you consider administering to P or B in the management of his euvolemic hyponatremia would you opt to administer lixisenatide tolvaptan uh, crisaborol or conivaptan I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer I would settle for tolvaptan. Now, if water restriction doesn't improve euvolemic hyponatremia, then uh, what we call the arginine vasopressin receptors or receptor antagonists may be considered. Now, there were two trials, SALT1 and SALT2, SALT-1 and-2, which demonstrated that tolvaptan which is an oral arginine vasopressor receptor V2 antagonist increased serum sodium more than placebo in patients with euvolemic and hypervolemic hyponatremia. Now answer A which is lixisenatide 
is a subcutaneously administered GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, that is indicated in the management or the treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus. So that would be the wrong option in this question. Uh, Crisoborol is a topically administered phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor that is indicated, if I remember well, in the management or treatment of mild to moderate atopic dermatitis. So that is off the mark. And uh, conivaptan is an intravenously administered arginine vasopressin receptor antagonist which can be used to raise sodium, sodium levels in hospitalized patients with euvolemic and hypervolemic hyponatremia. Remember this patient, I think is still at the clinic with, oh yeah, it's admitted to the ward. So, for oral administration, I would opt for answer B. Let's move to the next slide, please. The question reads, your laboratory department uploads the following results on the hospital intranet. So, these are an extract of the results. The sodium level is 115 milli equivalents per liter. The glucose is 340 milligrams per deciliter. So my question to you is, what is this patient's approximate true sodium concentration in the serum? Is it 130 milli equivalents per liter? Or is it 120 or is it 110 or 140 milli equivalents per liter? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. The correct answer is 120 and I'll quickly briefly explain how I got 120. Now to calculate a general estimation of the true sodium level you can raise the sodium by 2 to 2.5 for every 100 milligrams per deciliter over the first 100 mark now this patient of ours has a level of 340 so when you take 340 minus 100 you get 240 that means the sodium should be raised twice and that uh, gives you two times uh, using the upper limit 2.5 which becomes 5 milli equivalents per liter now you add that to the 115 which will give you 120 milli equivalents per liter that's a rough estimate now the correction for sodium based on glucose is to raise the sodium 1.6 for every 100 milligrams per deciliter of glucose over the 100 mark up to the moment you reach the 400 mark then you raise the sodium by 4 for every additional 100 using an average uh, you can raise the sodium about by 2 to 2.5 for every 100 milligram per deciliter of 100 uh, so basically that explains how I roughly reach the 120 which makes B the correct answer. Let's move to the next slide please. Question reads, a patient presents to your A&D with an arrhythmia and uh, he has severe hypocalcemia. Your clinic team decides your clinical team sorry decides to administer IV calcium replacement as per your hospital protocol uh, 100 to 300 milligrams of elemental calcium should be diluted in 50 to 100 ml of D5W prior to infusion so my question to you is which of the calcium compounds listed below would be or would you dilute in D5W? 
Is it calcium citrate, calcium glucose, calcium carbonate or calcium gluconate? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. The correct, correct answer is B. Now, calcium chloride and calcium gluconate are both available as intravenous formulations, while calcium citrate and calcium carbonate are available in oral formulations. Now, one gram of calcium chloride contains about 272 milligrams of elemental calcium. Now, a gram of calcium gluconate contains about 90 milligrams of elemental calcium so the chloride is closer to the 300 mark that we would like to supplement with now due to the differences in concentration calcium chloride should be administered via the central line except in very few situations such as a uh, case of uh, PEA cardiac arrest since it is very calm and it can be caustic to the smaller blood vessels and it may cause thrombophlebitis phlebite, sorry, in those smaller vessels. So I would settle for calcium chloride diluted in up to 100 ml of D5W prior to infusion. Let's move to the next slide. Mr. KHR, a male patient, presents to your A&D with a tremor increased reflexes and disorientation now your clinical team suspects magnesium deficiency based on this clinical picture so my question to you is which of the conditions listed below can lead to hypomagnesemia is it end-stage renal disease antacid overuse chronic alcoholism or addison's disease i'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer In my opinion, chronic alcoholism it is. Now, magnesium depletion can lead to a picture that we've seen above. It can also cause tremors, tetany, increased reflexes, personality changes can occur, patients can be disoriented, psychosis can occur, and even the QT interval can be prolonged when you... Uh, do an ECG. Now the common causes of hypomagnesemia include chronic alcoholism, pancreatitis, severe burns, even digestive system disorders can lead to it and uh, excessive use of diuretics can also cause hypomagnesemia. So that's just a by the way to explain why C is the correct answer. Let's move to the next slide, please. Question reads it. Which of the following conditions listed below is euvolemic hyponatremia commonly seen? Is it in heart failure, CKD, hypothyroidism, or SIDH? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So in this particular case, the last two answers are correct. Now, euvolemic hyponatremia can be seen in patients with conditions such as hypothyroidism, SIDH, beer potomania, those who have ingested ecstasy, psychogenic polydipsia, and even in water intoxication because there is normal total body sodium but a decrease in total body water. Now, CKD and heart failure are more common causes of hypervolemic hyponatremia because of an increase in both total body water and total body sodium. That's the difference there. Uh, but uh, the total body water is much greater than the total body sodium. Please note. Now, hypovolemic hyponatremia can be seen in patients with fluid loss, such as vomiting, diarrhea, or sweating. 
even in third space spacing where there is bowel obstruction where there are severe burns and even in diuretic use and it can also happen in sodium wasting syndrome for example so that those many words justify why the last two answers hypothyroidism and SID, SIADH are the correct answers to this question let's move to the next slide please the question reads why does hyperkalemia commonly manifest in patients with CKD is it due to decreased aldosterone activity is it due to impaired potassium excretion is it due to decreased renin release or is it due to increased muscular contraction and give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer in my opinion impaired potassium excretion is the major cause now hyperkalemia is common in later stages of chronic kidney disease due to impaired renal potassium excretion the kidneys are one of the primary regulators of total body potassium sodium calcium and magnesium now i would like just to emphasize that s inhibitors and arbs and renin inhibitors can also cause drug induced hyperkalemia by decreasing aldosterone activity which blocks sodium and water reabsorption and leads to potassium retention now beta blockers decrease renin release in the juxta glomerular cells in the nephron which indirectly re decreases aldosterone uh, however they rarely cause clinically relevant hyper Alimia. and uh, succinylcholine a depolarizing neuromuscular blocker increases muscular contraction which may compound on underlying hyperkalemia and uh, just like to emphasize that the joxin which decreases the sodium potassium ATPase activity causes potassium to remain extracellularly which is mostly seen in overdose situations now ns aids on the other hand can be a confounding factor in causing hyperkalemia by decreasing prostaglandin mediated perfusion of the renal afferent arterial but not typically in the general use of NSAIDs so those many words justify why impaired potassium excretion is the culprit in this particular question let's move to the next slide please the question reads which of the following is a rare etiology for the development of hypocalcemia is it hypoparathyroidism multiple myeloma diminished intake of calcium itself or vitamin d deficiency i'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer in my opinion my multiple myeloma it is now hypocalcemia is commonly caused by diminished intake hypoparathyroidism vitamin d deficiency but multiple myeloma causes hyper not hypocalcemia so that makes it the correct answer in this particular question let's move to the next slide please your clinical team is managing a 187 pound adult female uh, with acute symptomatic hyponatremia her reported sodium levels are 116 milliequivalents per liter the team decides to administer 3% hypertonic saline which contains 513 milliequivalents of sodium per liter so my question to you is 
what increase in cerium sodium would result from infusing a liter of this infusate? Would it be 10 milliequivalents per liter, 15 milliequivalents per liter, 5 milliequivalents per liter, or 20 milliequivalents per liter? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So 10 milliequivalents per litre it would be now to calculate how much 1 litre of the 3% hypertonic saline will raise this patient's serum sodium levels. You can use the formula, the infusate sodium minus the serum sodium divided by the total body water plus 1 gives you the correct value. Now we first of all must convert this patient's uh, weight to kilograms by dividing the 187 pounds by 2.2 and uh, a quick computation gives 85 kilos roughly now the total body water will therefore be for such a female will be 0 0.5 times the weight which is 0 0.5 times 85 since the approx uh, in such ladies approximately half of the body weight is water for younger women now that gives you a tbw or total body weight of 4.2 sorry 42.5 if i computed well now when you subtract 116 from 513 and divide the result by 42.5 and finally you add one to that it gives you approximately 10 so that's an approximately 10 milliequivalents per liter increase in sodium so dear ladies and gentlemen my highly esteemed and honored viewers and listeners that brings us to the end of part 37 of our pharmacotherapy mcq series which measured in endocrinology today now if this video helped you in any way i would like to remind you to give it a thumbs up and to like it and to share it widely with your peers and if you have not yet done so i'd like to humbly request you to subscribe to my youtube channel I would like to promise you that uh, the best is yet to come and I'm very thankful that you continue to collaborate with me and to support me. I look forward to interacting with you in the part 38 of our pharmacotherapy MCQ series. Thank you very much for always being there for me.